Up on offer today is the Terramaster Data Storage Manager. This, that logo looks awfully familiar. Terramaster. Terramaster. This is a NAS with 10 gigabit ethernet. Run on board. Let's unbox it and see what you get. So in the box you get the NAS itself, which is pretty lightweight with no drives in it. It's got two 80 millimeter fans at the rear. It's a metal, metal aluminum alloy case. It's pretty solid. It's got rubber feet. Doesn't feel like it wants to go anywhere. You also get a 12 volt 7.5 amp power brick in the box, an ethernet cable that's a nice high quality Cat6, a screwdriver and screws, and more feet because you'll have to use these screws with the mechanical hard drives. It's not a, it's not toolless or anything. It does come with screws for SSDs and hard drives though, which is a nice touch. Now, how would you like to win this? How would you like to, to have this NAS and have it be all yours? Well, I've got, you know, I don't, I don't need another NAS. So I agreed with TerraMaster. TerraMaster sent me this so that I could review it, no strings attached, but I also decided to give it away. It's not terrible, it's pretty decent. But in order to test it, it's like it's 10 gigabit, theoretically we could do a gigabyte per second. How could we achieve a gigabyte per second? And that's easy, SSDs. Lots and lots of SATA SSDs in here. I've got four inland one terabyte SSDs. Fresh from Micro Center, I paid for these. These are one terabyte, so four terabytes total storage. I can do RAID 5 or RAID 6 or RAID 10. If I only use four drives with this enclosure, I can do the hot spare thing. It's got five bays, so it supports a wide variety of RAID options. Under the hood, it runs Linux, but it's TerraMaster's sort of proprietary Linux operating system. It has apps and some other features. Not a lot of apps, but it does have apps, and you can install, you can SSH in, and it has a lot of options. The CPU that's in here is a Celeron J3455. This thing has four gigabytes of memory, but it is upgradable up to 12 gigabytes. So you get the four that's kind of built in and you can put in another eight, an eight gig dim, 12 gigabytes, not bad. That Celeron, that's a true four core. It also has an iGPU. And yes, the software stack is here for you to be able to do transcoding with the iGPU. So knock on wood, you could make this a fancy little Plex server. It does have a built-in application for both Plex and iTunes, along with a number of other backup applications. It also supports cloud backup to things like Amazon S3, Glacier, other third-party services. So it's got some cloud integration for being able to do your backups. At the rear I.O., we've got a single 10 gig Ethernet port, two 1 gig Ethernet ports, HDMI, and two USB 3.0 ports. At the front, we have a power button, status LEDs for power and LAN, as well as five hard drive LEDs for each of the five three and a half inch bays. Now these three and a half inch bays are designed for mechanical hard drives, but you can use a mix of SSDs and mechanical hard drives. You could use one SSD, for example, and four mechanical hard drives or three and two or whatever combination you want. My recommendation is to just don't even bother with SSDs and just go full mechanical storage. You know, load this thing up with 10 plus terabyte hard drives, 50 terabytes, no problem. For my testing, I use WD Reds that I got from Alan Malventano. But it's a long story. The fans at the rear here, they are 80 millimeter fans. However, they have a funky little four pin connector. It would have been nice if they'd used standard four pin connectors. Just in case one of the fans die, you could get a standard PC fan. As it stands, I don't think you'd have too much trouble modifying a standard four pin PC fan to fit this thing, but you know, it'll just be slightly annoying. Now internally, this thing looks pretty interesting. We've got a DDR4 DIMM slot, so that's the upgradability that I was mentioning before. You can put an eight gig DIMM in here and take this thing up to 12 gigs. We have four gigs that are soldered on. At the rear, you can see that there is a hidden reset. So you could use a paper clip or something like that to hit the reset button and clear it. There are also two USB 2.0 ports hidden on an internal header. One of those is occupied by a USB flash drive, which contains the operating system for this thing. As this thing does have HDMI out, this could be a modder slash hacker's dream because it's a relatively standard x86 Celeron platform. It can boot from USB, presumably it can also boot from SATA. It has multiple ethernet interfaces. You could turn this into a combination NAS and router. Generally, I don't recommend that kind of thing because you don't want your NAS to also be responsible for security. It is a four core Celeron, which would be fine for containerization services if you wanted to run containerization services. So you could have a router that supports, you know, something like Docker and do that. But the Celeron 
you know, the Celeron family of CPUs from Intel is gimped in all sorts of unexpected ways. So, you know, I think that's really sort of pushing the envelope of what this hardware is capable of. I can also see that internally we have a standard CR2032 CMOS battery, and there are no other fans. The heatsink for both the 10 gigabit Ethernet interface and the CPU are passive heatsinks that are no doubt meant to have airflow as a result of the dual 80 millimeter fan. I was kind of hoping that internally there would be a header for something like a disk on module or SATA or something like that. I would love to be able to put in a you know, an M.2, say even a SATA M.2 or something like that for caching so that it doesn't occupy one of our three and a half inch bays. The question though for me at the very front of my mind was how fast is it? How fast can I manage with that 10 gigabit ethernet port? Well, that Celeron J3455, it's only a 1.5 gigahertz processor. It can turbo a little bit, but using SSDs to test where each SSD can do about 400 megabytes per second real world. I mean, advertised they're a little, faster on the advertising, but real world about 400 megabytes per second each. So, you know, just a three way setup with SSDs in this thing could more than saturate 10 gigabit ethernet. Well, this enclosure can manage a pretty reasonable 350 to 450 megabytes per second when you're using SMB 3.0. Now, because it is multi-core, it does technically support SMB multi-channel. And so if you're running a single SMB process, it's more like 200 megabytes per second. But if you can saturate the, the, the CPU actually running SMB multi-channel, and even if your, your machine that you're connecting from only has a single 10 gig ethernet, that just means it's running multiple streams. So I say that because depending on what your network configuration is, you may not actually be able to take advantage of SMB multi-channel. But best case scenario, about 450 megabytes per second. Worst case scenario, about 200 megabytes per second. Again, the theoretical maximum there is a gigabyte per second. But still, for something that is as small and quiet as this is, that's not terrible. That's pretty good. All right, so under the hood, there are a few surprises. One, the onboard, DDR, the onboard memory is uh, LPDDR3 we can actually configure some of the power management settings as well. So we can squeeze just a little bit more performance out of that Celeron CPU. You can get into BIOS. You can just, you know, spam delete as you boot. The onboard HDMI confirm does work as console. Linux boots up completely normally off of the USB 2 uh, memory stick. It is possible to boot other operating systems. Uh, in fact, the BIOS supports Intel Linux, in, which is uh, kind of Intel's embedded, uh, embedded Linux. Windows and some other options. Now, obviously if you do that, you can't get support from TerraMaster. You're, you're kind of abandoning their operating system, but because it's on a USB stick, it makes it pretty easy to experiment. You can just cleanly shut it down, pull that USB stick, put in another USB stick, boot from it, do whatever. There is a wrinkle though, and the wrinkle is the uh, ethernet situation. It has physical, three physical ports on the back, one 10 gig interface, that's an Aquantia 10 gig NIC. It's uh, powered by the Atlantic, driver and a relatively recent Linux kernel, I might add. The other two gigabit interfaces are powered by a single Realtek gigabit NIC. So each individual port is not addressable through a physical hardware. You've only got ETH0, which in this configuration was the Aquantia NIC, and ETH1, which was the Realtek gigabit NIC. I don't really know that that's too much of a problem, but in terms of like whatever crazy hackery that you might have in mind for an x86 platform that has, you know, five SATA interfaces. It seems like you've got a lot of options for doing stuff outside the uh, the lines if you want to do some some stuff here with the, uh, the Celeron J processor. Uh, I especially like being able to disable the power management stuff because you could get quite a bit more performance out of it, pushing 500 megabytes per second on your SMB file transfers, basically maxing out the CPUs, at least until you hit the uh, the maximum turbo or thermal window, whichever, you know, sort of came first. You can also control the fan profiles. So if you'd prefer a higher RPM fan uh, for more cooling, even though it's gonna be a little bit louder, you can totally tweak that in, in the BIOS. So there's actually a lot of options here that you can get at the console. The, uh, the login's root and the password's admin. So a lot of fun there, it's sort of exciting. So even though it's only got four gigs of onboard memory, you can upgrade that with an eight gig DIMM in the unpopulated DIMM slot that's right on the motherboard. So that's nice. And like I say, the onboard memory is LPDDR3. So you've got some options in terms of, you know, hackability and that kind of thing. That said, the performance with SSDs was pretty good. The performance with mechanical hard drives is not gonna be anywhere near the performance that you could get from SSDs. I mean, the best that you can expect with mechanical hard drives is gonna be on the order of like 250 
megabytes per second. And if you're using a bunch of really large drives, I really would recommend RAID 6. That gives you two drives of redundancy. So with five drives total, let's say just to keep the math easy, if you're using 10 terabyte hard drives, you put five 10 terabyte hard drives in here, you would have 50 terabytes of raw capacity, but by the time you use two of your drives, capacity for redundancy, you'd only have about 30 terabytes of usable space. And a lot of operating systems and other stuff count by powers of two, not powers of 10. So it'll say 26 terabytes or 28 terabytes of usable space instead of 30 because it's it's counting a slightly different way. Uh, not, not, not by powers of 10. You also lose a little bit of, of overhead there. The idea with RAID 6 is that OneDrive can die and while uh, you replace that drive and while the new blank drive is having 10 terabytes of information synced to it another drive could die and so with RAID 6 that is a survivable condition with RAID 5 that is not a survivable condition uh, the other thing is that uh, when you lose data or things get weird you don't necessarily have a complete drive failure one of the drives can start lying with RAID 5 if one of the drives is returning bad data, there's not really an easy way to compute which drive is lying. With RAID 6, it's easy because you've got two drives. You can figure out which drive contains incorrect information, assuming that the other five drives in a RAID 6 configure, or the other four drives in a RAID 6 configuration uh, are working correctly. So you only have three terabytes of usable space. And that's also the only reason that I would consider this NAS and not a NAS with a smaller number of three and a half inch base, like two or three, three and a half inch base. I don't think it's sufficient really for a NAS. And the reason for that is uh, there, there is one special use case and I'll talk about that in a second. But the reason for that is capacity versus speed. Even with 10 gig ethernet, which is a gigabyte per second, you know, there's a little bit of overhead there. There's a latency. There's other factors in there that make it hard for you to see a one gigabyte per second you know, realized performance on your LAN. Not the least of which is the fact that you're using mechanical hard drives with this. Yes, caching is an option. Yes, if you add more RAM to it, it'll perform better with multiple clients. Using this as a backup appliance, an iTunes server, a Plex server, because it does have, you know, the onboard iGPU. Those sort of use cases in a small, very small office or home user use case make a lot of sense to me. If you wanted to go with a small NAS that only had two bays, your only option for redundancy is mirroring. You can mirror the drives. And you're back to the problem of if one of the drives um, becomes a little bit corrupted, by default with all of these software setups, there's not really a way to tell if the information is corrupted, which drive has the corrupt information. There's just a 50-50 shot, you're gonna get corrupt information. That's, that's bit rot, basically. There are file systems and um, storage systems that will prevent that, but for the Linux operating system and MD uh, and the version that this runs, you don't really get that. You could get that with ZFS. You could go off reservation and install you know, your own Linux operating system and run with something like ZFS, but with Linux MD and some of the other options, you're not gonna get that. So if you're gonna get a NAS, I always recommend at least a five bay NAS. And the fact this thing's got 10 gigabit, and it's pretty hackable. I think that's pretty cool. It's gonna come down to price. You're gonna to have to do comparison shopping and look at what you get for the price of this in your local market. Can you build it? Would you rather DIY it? You may be able to DIY it cheaper, but then this is a nice little tiny package that's not super loud, but it's also kind of hackable. So I like the hackability. So I wanna give this away, and I wanna give this away to a commenter on the video, uh, but I don't really have a super easy way to get a hold of you, and YouTube's kind of weird. So uh, leave me a comment and tell me what you would do with this and you also have to leave a comment in the thread on the level one forum that goes with this video so that I can actually find you and track you down to match you to your, your email. So you can link to your, your comment on YouTube or just paste the same thing or whatever, but you'll have to probably comment in both places. I don't know how to, I don't know how to do this. I don't want to set off any kind of like, you know, insanity, but I've just, I just want to give it away. Like how crazy is that? I mean, TerraMaster sent it to me. I don't need it. Why don't I give it to you guys? So. All right, uh, go to the forum, find the thread, comment there. Ideally also comment on YouTube because, you know, just a sentence or two or three, what would you do if I gave it to you? Like, what are you gonna do with it? Let me know. And uh, I'm just gonna pick, probably at random, but maybe also creative answers. I don't know, you just have to live in suspense, but uh, ship it out. Worldwide shipping is okay, don't care. I mean, 
Uh, I reserve the right to, you know, not send it to Iran. That might get me in trouble with the State Department. Sorry. But uh, otherwise, mostly worldwide shipping. And uh, there you go. I'm Wendell. This is Level 1. I'm signing out, and I'll see you later. Don't forget to enter the contest.